Hello, and welcome to another one of my walk and talk epics, where I pontificate and muse upon um, aspects of being a creative person. Now I've been doing a series of these over the last six months or so, um, under the title of The Truth About Being in a Band, and this is another one of those really. But I'm going to expand it into kind of a general conversation about, I think, one of the cr most crucial aspects of being creative. And I guess an extension of that for me, obviously, is the fact that I've been largely involved in the music business, which, you know, I do think, on, you know, upon reflection, after 35 years working, uh, as a sort of professional musician most of that time or there were moments where I wasn't but pretty much I think even the resting periods or when I was doing other things were because I was trying to get back to the music business but by extension of that it's you know I think the music business is one of the most <clears throat> certainly in my experience the most difficult business um, I've ever been involved in so today's topic is something that I feel is so important to get your head around so and also very difficult to navigate and it's this this word failure because actually failure is good but it takes an awful lot of stamina an awful lot of um <clears throat> you know um self-reflection strength uh resilience to stand up to failure and to use the difficulty of failure. Now, I heard this phrase uh, mentioned by the great Michael Caine in an interview. I may have mentioned this before, and if I have, and you've watched it before, you're probably rolling your eyes saying, you're just talking the same old stuff, Jepson. Well, you know what? All of this, if this stuff crosses over, and it's worth re-mentioning these things occasionally, but he was talking about, Michael Caine was talking about how um, a director he was working with they were planning a scene in a film and Michael Caine was completely and utterly ready for the scene but sort of stumbled into the scene and something he wasn't expecting to happen to him in the scene flummoxed him and so it kind of he felt frustrated and uh, walked off feeling like a failure he wasn't in control of the situation he didn't know how to you know figure out the difficulties that he encountered so he had a conversation with that director I forget who it was now and the director said to him look being an actor is about using the difficulties it's about bringing a reality to the situation to your role and whenever you encounter something that is unexpected, the secret of really unlocking yourself as a creative person, in his case, an actor, is to use that difficulty and bring it in to the situation so you can show, I guess, the levels of complexity that perhaps wouldn't have been there if the difficulty wasn't in place. So buoyed up with this newfound inspired piece of information from this director he uh, prepared for another scene and unbeknownst to him the director had put a chair in front of the door that he was supposed to enter into this room uh, and it wasn't supposed to be there so Michael Caine armed with this new knowledge walked into the scene the door bashed into the chair but instead of him failing and faltering, he remembered what the director had said about using difficulty, and he brought the chair into the scene and used that chair as a way of enhancing his character's traits, whatever that was. And ever since then, he's taught his children and taught to anyone that would listen, <laughs> including me, that the key to succeeding in any real art form, and probably in anything in life, actually, let's not just hem it in with the, with the art business, the art world, is to use whatever difficulty 
is put in front of you. So let's talk about the music industry and let's talk about the difficulties in the music industry because there are many. And of course, we've talked about this before and I've talked about the, um, the strategies that you can build, the way that you can galvanize your people around you. Because like we've said before in a previous one of these walk and talks, it's all about the people. I still believe that. Absolutely, I do. You're only as strong as the people you have around you. So even when that is happening, you can build your strategies, you can plan, you can organize, you can present yourselves correctly, you can get all these things in place. But inevitably, there's going to be the unknown reality of life impacting upon your dreams and hopes and fears. And this is something that I think he's never really discussed and talked about enough because there are so many moving parts to be in a band, to be an actor, to be a writer, to be in anything. But I suppose with the art world, because as I've called it before, and the great Martin Tibbetts, my friend and uh, confidant said, you know, we exist in a hope economy when you're an artist, whether you're a musician, songwriter, writer, whatever, it's the hope economy. There is no absolute. So that is unlike, so this, so this situation is unlike a lot of other people's jobs where you do an interview, you know, you're skilled because you've gone through university degree or you've done an apprenticeship and your skills are written down on a bit of paper somewhere or are spoken about by other people. Um, and so you, you are already ahead of the game in terms of people accepting what you do. Now, by and large, that doesn't exist in the music business. You don't get a job like that. It is the hope economy. It is the, the actualization, the reality, the manifestation of a dream, an idea, a hope, a, get, a, a goal that is entirely frivolous in lots of ways. <laughs> you know, it's kind of vocational, of course, that word we use a lot, something that you aspire to. You wake up in the morning, if you, well, if you're not waking up in the morning and dreaming about it, and going to bed at night to go to dream about it, then you're probably in the wrong game anyway. But it's inspired by all kinds of mechanics, emotional mechanics that are nothing to do with being represented by academia or um, any form of qualification. The only qualification we have as an artist is defined by the things that we do and the things that we achieve, which are monumentally difficult. And so it is often, just to set the groundwork for this conversation, it is often the question that I get asked, specifically when I was working a lot as a record producer, I would get a young band, I worked with a lot of young bands, who would literally say stuff to me, you know, we'd maybe we'd spent a week together and we're getting to know each other quite well. And there'd often be a moment where I'd be in the studio and one of them would turn to me and say, so how do you make it? How do you achieve success? Because maybe they've scratched the surface, maybe they've got a local following, or maybe they've got a slightly elevated national following and Planet Rock are playing them, or they've been in a couple of magazine reviews, you know, some, or the local BBC radio stations played a track and made, you know, fanfares about how fantastic they are, but yet nothing's lifting. And I always reply with the same thing. The bands that succeed are the ones that don't give up. I know it's easier said than done, of course. You know, you know, you buy the right guitar, you get the right amplifier, you've done your rehearsals, you've got your focus, you've got your vision. All these things I've talked about before, which are really, really important. You know, let's say for a moment, let's look at the best case scenario. You found a bunch of people. Let's say you're a five piece band like Little Angels were. You've got, you know, everyone's getting on great. Everyone's pulling in the same direction. Everyone's happy and the music's going great. You know, you've written a great song. You think, God, you know, we've really got this, but you can't get arrested. You do a couple of local shows, but no one's interested outside of that. Or even if you get a local, a, a regional show and you go and play some gig and two people turn up, it can be incredibly dispiriting. And it's, it's kind of like one of those situations where I often sort of think about that whole, 
brilliant Facebook meme that I've seen about how, you know, there's a picture of a guy's coffin. I think I may have mentioned this before. Again, I don't care if I have. You're going to have to put up with me repeating myself. I am getting old after all. But um, <laughs> I love the meme where there's a guy in a coffin and there's a room full of chairs, empty chairs, apart from one or two people dotted about. And there's two people at the front and one turns to the other and says, I don't understand it. He's got a massive following on Facebook and no one turns up, right? So that's kind of a bit of the same thing, especially in this day and age with social media, of course, no point going around all those houses again, but we know that you can get stuck in a bubble. We know that a website does not make a band. We know if you've been listening to anything I've said at all, that it's about the music. It's about the songs, the songs, the songs, the songs. I've even added an extra song there, but it's true. You can get all that stuff right. You can build up your presence of mind and your and your optimism about, yes, man, we've got it. But yet you can still meet that brick wall of indifference and lack of interest and people just going, why should we care? So this is when the whole use your difficulty scenario kicks in. I'll continue this by saying failure absolutely is good. I said this earlier on, but it absolutely is true. Failure sets you up to figure out what's gone wrong or what has gone right, <laughs> but how you haven't somehow overcome whatever hurdle it was in the way. So these are moments of clarity, I call them. You know, It's a place where if you're brave enough, if you can accept the failure, if you can understand why the failure happened, then you're already on the course for greater success. But therein lies the rub. It is a struggle because when you are on the side of the hard shoulder in the pissing rain with the van broken down, either because you've run out of petrol because you can't afford the petrol or the big end's gone on or whatever, or the brakes have blown or you've crashed or whatever, and you're missing the gig and you're all away from your loved ones and you've had to take a day off work or you've just spent your last bit of money that you've saved up on getting the van fixed, but yet it's broken down again. All of these things conspire and you're cold, you're in the back of the van, it's freezing and it's in the winter, you know, whatever scenario you think of. All of these things are all stepping stones to figuring out whether these failures are important enough and are strong enough to strive you, to give you that strive, to keep going forward, to keep thinking, well, I don't even care. I do not care if the van doesn't work because we'll get the van working. I don't care if we've turned up to the gig and I haven't changed my strings and we don't have any extra strings because we can't afford them. We'll get through it, you know, because the other alternative is fear. Now, someone said to me, a very wise man who's sadly not on this planet anymore, but one of the wisest people I ever met, Tony Fitzgerald, an Australian chap I shared a flat with years ago at the height of the Little Angel's success. And Tony was a flatmate of mine in Bristol who was the single most positive person I think I've ever met in my life. And everything that came out of his mouth was a positive. Even when the most insurmountable odds were against him, Tony would say, ah, don't worry about it, man. We'll get over this. We'll go forward. We'll find a way. And he taught me so much. And I didn't really kind of know at the time how much he was teaching me this sort of strategy. Because weirdly, at that point in my life, which was the Jam Album era, there was a lot of stuff going on in the band that was difficult fallings out, business aspects, relationships were, were collapsing. And yet we were about to sort of embark upon the most important period of our career, which was our third album. And so I was kind of blind, deaf and dumb, if you like, to how to overcome that particular failure. Because here's the thing, failure happens when you're at your most successful as well. So getting back to Mr. Fitzgerald, who sadly, like I say, is no longer with us and I wish he was, but I remember him saying to me once on the phone, I was, I'd, Little Angels were split up and I was, I'd moved down to Bristol permanently. I wasn't really in the music business at the time because I was so skinned and I'd tried to do my Toby and the Whole Truth album and tour and that had sort of sadly <coughs> fallen on deaf ears and that was a huge problem and I had pneumonia and, you know, I, I was feeling really low. It was one of the lowest points of my life, I have to say, as a musician. And I spoke, Tony rang me up out of the blue. And I was giving it, well, oh, you know, I'm going to give up. I'm a failure. I'm an imposter. 
you know, I don't know why people like me or like the music. It wasn't down to me. You know, moan, moan, moan. Oh, Tony, to his absolute credit, listen to all this mithering and whimpering from me. And turned around to me and he said, you're coming at this through a point of view of fear. And I said, yeah, dead right, I'm fearful. He said, no, 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 no. Fuck everything and run. Fear, F-E-A-R. And I sort of took a step back and he then he explained to me that, you know, because he was a life coach, actually part of what he did was, was a life coach. Sorry, I'm just tramping through six inches of water and mud here at the moment. But, <laughs> but anyway, he said, he said, look, it's very easy to run. It's really easy to turn around and say, fuck everything, I'm going to run, I'm going to get out of there. But he said, it's not easy to continue carrying on striving and he said look at it from this point of view all of the effort everything that you've put in up till this point all those years of success all that time and energy that you have expended often to the detriment of your relationships with your girlfriends wives families all that stuff think of all that time that you put into that and all that stuff the difficulties you created with other people and the times you were away, if you fuck it all now and run, you've lost every single moment of that. So as you can probably imagine, it was quite a moment. And I took a little step back and I felt then, then I felt embarrassed and I felt that he was absolutely right. Because you don't go through the world in a bubble. If you're lucky, really, I mean, some people do, of course, some people sadly don't have people that have got their back. But when I think about my time as a young person and the amount of effort that my mum and dad put in, the amount of times that people that I cared for and wanted to be with, I couldn't be with them because I was out doing a gig or I was stuck on the hard shoulder with the van broken down. When I think about all that and the sacrifices that they gave actually, for me, I mean, my dad, God bless him, used to come out in his Land Rover and rescue us, <laughs> you know, towing the van in, that sort of thing. When I think, when I thought about all that stuff, I felt deeply embarrassed about it. And I thought, hang on a minute, the only reason, well, a lot of the reason why I was able to succeed is because of that support. Experience with Tony kind of changed my outlook and I began to gather myself again from that point onwards and started looking at things from an entirely more positive angle and since then I you know I haven't really lost it because I remember back to that conversation that it's very easy to give up exceptionally easy to give up we can all walk away when someone doesn't like our song I'm getting back to the music here obviously or two people turn up to a gig or you've worked all year and nothing's happening and Two members of the band are getting bored or they're getting nagged at by their girlfriends or whatever. So you have to then have to ask yourself the question, how far am I willing to go? How much am I willing to commit? How much of this failure can I use to my own advantage? So I can remember times when the little angels were, you know, in a situation where, just like I've described, I remember one particular time we were playing in South Wales and we had nowhere to stay. It was in the snow. And we ended up sleeping in the van, you know, did that several times. But this particular time I remember because the van was so packed full of 4B12 Marshall cabinets, etc., etc., there was hardly any room to sleep anywhere. So I ended up sleeping on the top of these Marshall cabinets with my legs dangling over the end of them and leaning back onto my sleeping bag on the top of these cabinets. And it was freezing cold. So I woke up, I swear to God, I have never felt so stiff. My back was in bits but yet we had to go and do another gig as I remember you know but I never once at that particular point in my my life felt that those things were difficult because we'd all banded together the whole band was in it we were all so committed to each other that nothing was going to stand in our way even when we did meet these failures and these difficulties and these struggles we saw it as a positive we absolutely did and so when people have asked me, like I said earlier on, how do you, how do you make it? That is my only honest answer. 
we never gave up. We never stopped believing in it. Even at the darkest moments, we were still able somehow to gather the energy, to think to ourselves, this isn't how, what it's gonna be like forever. This is a momentary thing. It will pass, the difficulty will pass. But again, this whole use the difficulty thing, the reason why I reacted so strongly to the Michael Caine story is because I remember feeling that myself. No, no one ever told us that though. You know, we, we knew that it was difficult. We knew that it was a struggle. But the one thing we knew we would never do was, stop, was that we were gonna stop. Because the alternatives were too grave. You know, we had so much to say, we, we, we wanted it so badly, that the alternative to, to making it, if, if it was failure, then we simply weren't gonna accept it. This is where um, these conversations cross over, because I know that I've touched upon these things before, about the person, uh, personnel in your band and the relationships that you build with each other, but it's all interconnected. But I do think that the fear of failure is something that can absolutely hamstring any band. It can stop you from going out to rehearsals. You know, when you sat at, you know, you just got back from work, you got back from sixth form college or anything like that. And it's, you know, say it's this time of the year. I mean, we're only two weeks, we're on the 11th of December today, two weeks away from the big day. I can remember times when we were, you know, we'd got gigs booked down in Wales or somewhere, you know, and we were up in Scarborough. We had a gig down in London, you know, I remember at Christmas time, one of the most important gigs we ever did down at the Marquee Club towards Christmas, you know, and we were only, but you know, we, it would have been so easy to go, oh God, you know, we, do we really want to drag those 350 miles or 400 miles down all those roads, you know, packs of people getting ready to go to the, the, the folks' homes for, for Christmas and all that. Do we really want to get stuck in that? Now we'll just stay here and we'll watch films and we'll hang out and we'll go to the pub and talk about being in a band. We'll talk about what it means to be in a band and we'll talk about how much, how many plans we're going to make. Well, you cannot do that. You have to go and do it. And I can remember those times we'd just, you know, we'd be getting in the van a week before Christmas and we'd go off and do a show or a couple of shows or whatever it was, but we did it happily because we knew that we were building the box. You know, these were building blocks. We were building our future and it never ever felt like a struggle for us at all. I can't remember ever thinking, God, I'd rather just stay at home. I couldn't wait to get on the stages. Here's another thing. Failure is very, very easy to, to recognize, isn't it? When you miss a chord on stage or you know, say if you're an actor and you miss your cue or you, you, or you can't get a gig, you're in your garret and, you know, you're, you're struggling. I mean, I know a couple of great actors that I'm really good friends with that work in call centres, you know, and they're just waiting for that one show to, that, that, that one gig or that one, um, you know, role to, to drop. So everything's going to change, but they don't give up. You know, the very fact that they're working in a call centre means they aren't failing. It means they're using the failure. They're using the difficulty because if they don't do that, the alternatives are too, too grave because they spent all that time getting ready to do it. I mean, my own daughter, Maddie. I mean, I've never been so proud than the day, you know, in lockdown when, I mean, she was at, this is a really good example of it. She was at a, a acting, an acting school in Guildford, the Guildford School of Acting, and edu um, graduated into COVID. So pretty much the last year of what she did, she was not at um, university. So what does she do? And I don't want to make a great big song and dance about this because Maddie, you know, she's my daughter, of course, but I look upon it as a fantastic case study. So instead of crying into a bowl of cereal every morning, she took herself off up into a bedroom. She was living at our house at this time. Obviously she'd come back from university to basically um, be in lockdown with us. And she started to do stuff online, something she hadn't really done before. You know, she hadn't, she hadn't sort of indulged herself massively in TikTok or any of these things. She'd just taken part like all young people of her, her generation do, of course, you know, the usual social media antics. But she started to do stuff on TikTok. And I can remember her coming downstairs and saying, Mum, Dad, look, I've, I've had, I don't know, 300,000 views of this video I've done. And she showed us this video and it was this kind of crazy sort of comedic, thing and uh, and it went from there and she started to build upon that whole concept and she'd never done it before in her life and she built her experience over lockdown she used the difficulty she overcame the the failure by turning the failures and the negatives into a positive and now she's got a career as 
I didn't even know it was a thing, really, but I didn't even understand it. But as an influencer, and she's doing very, very well, and she's traveling the world, and she's living her best life. Now, yes, it's an extreme example, but the point is, she didn't give up. Even though she wanted to be in the on the West End, and, or even just get a part in any play. She wasn't, you know, she, she's a very modest person, Maddie. You know, she didn't want the big stars and, you know, I don't know everyone who's, who's a, who gets into the art world wants major success. But of course, you've got to temper it by reality. And she was very, one of the things they taught her at the, at the, at the university was this sort of sense of understanding your market, understanding who you were, what was possible, and the realism of it all. Point is, Maddie is an example of someone who used the difficulty, didn't fuck everything and run didn't decide oh well it's uh, when it's all over i'll just go and find a job you know she wanted to carry on she wanted to find another way and she did so i think that's the same with anything to do with the art world and again back to music that was my experience and what happens is is that it builds resilience it takes your vulnerability as people and turns it into resilience and i can't tell you how important that is so for all the bands and musicians out there watching this or anyone who's watching this and getting anything out of it at all, I think the key element here is that not giving up is the key to success. I know it sounds really, really obvious, but like I've tried to explain, it is really obvious. It's a really easy way to escape the, the ravages and the anxieties of, of what you might perceive as personal failure. But I'm here to tell you, it really isn't, you know. So, so what are the mechanisms? Let's just talk about some of the mechanisms. So first and foremost, I think one of the key things is to recognize what you're actually good at and make the most of that. And now if you're anything like me, most creative people can, can by and large wear lots of hats. <laughs> it's part of the process of developing yourself is you have to have a number of, I guess, irons in fires and you quite often when you're doing stuff yourself, when you're self-managing, you're putting the rehearsals together for the band, you're maybe writing the songs, you're the leader, that you can wear these hats. Now, I've, you wear too many hats. I've seen this happen time and time again with lots of bands I've worked with. One band that shall remain nameless who were fantastic, but failed because the singer of the band was absolutely unbelievable dynamic. He was the manager, he was the booker, he was the guy that talked to the promoters, he did the artwork, he was a, a graphic designer. You know, he was, always arranging things but the last thing he did was spend any time on his voice and actually on the songs and so by the time i got involved and we were in rehearsals it was a huge uphill struggle to even try and figure out what the band wanted and what they meant and who they were because there was more time spent in sort of organizing all the other stuff so it's like putting the cart before the horse now i don't put them down at all because they with work and with time and effort they became something something fantastic but here's the kicker they'd spent so much time getting this situation up and running before they got involved with me and they were failing and nothing was happening for them particularly that by the time i got involved and we were starting to make a proper record the the energy had gone out of the band and they started to certainly this the leader of the band had started to sort of lack belief in the whole thing and instead of using the difficulty of we've come this far they split up now that story isn't uncommon this is very common in fact lots of bands it's not a it's not by any um it's not a dig at this band at all because i'm not going to tell you who they are anyway but but i've encountered this a number of times with other people um i mean you know often people they've got partners and somebody gets you know their girlfriend or wife gets pregnant uh, they get a new job they're trying to keep things going, they're getting pressure from home. And so it's inevitable to a certain degree in certain situations with bands that are in that particular scenario, it's only gonna end in failure and, and, and the fear factor. So to conclude um, the, the, this part of the conversation, you have to focus, yeah, getting back to the whole focus of what you're good at. It's really important. You cannot wear a million hats. You have to delegate. Great bands and great situations with artistic teams of people, know what they're good at and focus in on that and bring everybody's powers to bear you know you can't you can't pretend that you know how to manage a band as well as write songs as well as be a booking you know pretending to be a booking agent and ringing venues you will kill yourselves emotionally you'll kill yourselves and psychologically if you don't get the results you'll feel like a failure and again 
very hard to overcome. So I think that's one thing that Little Angels, because it's my only point of reference really, and my own point of reference, because I've obviously had a, I've had an independent career as well as being in a major band like that, is that you just have to focus in on the good stuff, focus on the stuff you really understand and make the most of that and find other people that, that can understand all the other stuff and, and, and surround yourself with those people. They have to be trustworthy. That's not always easy. That's another user difficulty. Trust your instincts. Just because it's covered in gold doesn't mean to say it is gold, if you know what I mean. You have to read between the lines. You have to be savvy and smart. When someone says they're going to deliver you the world, walk away. If someone says, I don't know what I can do, but I'll do my best, you've probably got a chance. It's about belief and understanding each other and putting your trust in people to a certain point. Don't always trust, you know, because I can tell you, once you've been bitten by a situation with someone who promises the world and gives you gives you nothing but expects everything back in uh, you know for, for that lack of effort if you like then you'll understand you know that can often be the, the killer that can be the one where you go well I've had enough of this they're all sharks they're all bastards all that sort of stuff well of course they aren't there's lots of great people out there that have as much interest in the music business aspect of things as you have in playing your guitar or writing a song but it's just about finding them and delegating but having control, keeping hold of control, one of the things that I lost control of for a period of time really was that. I sort of, as a young person, gave far much trust, to, so far too much of my own trust to people that really were untrustworthy. And, and, you know, it's unfortunately for me, it took a long time to figure that out, but I don't let that happen anymore. I use the difficulty, but I didn't, I didn't give up. So, you know, there are lots of other ways that you can sort of I guess a mass, a, an armory of responses and an armory of physical things to help you overcome that, that, the bumps in the road, the failure feelings. But I think really I've kind of answered many of the questions really there anyway, that it is about the people. And all I can say to you is, is that when it feels like a, dis a mistake or it feels like a difficulty or something you really hadn't thought about or hadn't anticipated coming up against then don't run away take a long hard look at it whatever that situation was even if it's terrible within the band even if it's a difficulty that's occurring within the ranks of the band have the guts and the gumption and the balls to sit down and talk it through because if you really want it if you really want to succeed you have to overcome these things I wish I'd had more balls. I wish I'd been smarter in the beginning of the Little Angels, that I could have been emotionally more together, that I could have sat down and discussed the, my, the things I was feeling that were problems. I wish I'd had the, the gumption to face up to some of these people that I felt stood in the way and were always taking, taking, taking and giving very little back. I wish I had, but I didn't. But now, as an older person, I've spent the last 20 years not doing that. And I've done it all entirely on my own terms and I'm still here. I haven't given up. So even though I'm not a rich man, I still managed to make music. I still carried on doing the things that I want to do. Because every time that I faced failure and every time that I've had failure and every time that I've had to face myself and ask the question, how do I carry on with this? Why am I doing this? then you know what? The moment I say that to myself and I face this possibility of fuck everything and run and giving up, a part of me just goes, hang on a minute, what are you gonna do then instead? And I automatically then start to get more optimistic and more, I guess, I'm bolstered by that because I go back to the start of when I was a young kid in that rehearsal room or in my bedroom trying to work out a song. And I remember the feeling of that and I remember that even though I may not be the most successful and biggest musician in the world, I've written over 600 songs. I've made countless records. I've had some fantastic times. I've met some amazing people. And the one thing I didn't do was give up.